Hey, this is Zach Log the Great, and I am here tonight with my friend Nate. Nate the Mediocre, signing in. And we are also joined by uh, John C. Wright, a uh, science fiction author, uh, most recently of, uh, one of, well, one of his most recent books is uh, The Last Straw, um, about the uh, catastrophic failings of, um, the, one of, of the recent uh, Disney Star Wars movie. I'm also known as John the Petty, and that is for a variety of reasons. <laughs> So, um, we are getting together tonight uh, to uh, talk about um, C.S. Lewis's poem, A Cliché Came Out of Its Cage. Um, as usual, I was going to mention quickly, if you enjoy my work, if you like seeing what I do, um, feel free to stop by uh, my Subscribestar page. Uh, it goes from $1 up to $5 a month. Um, and the, uh, that's subscribestar.com slash Zachlog hyphen the hyphen great. And of course there's going to be a link down below. And having said all that, we can go ahead and I'm going to put up, put up the poem. Um, it is in a cliche came out of its cage. It's in two sections. Um, Mr. Wright was plant is, will be reading the first section and, um, Nate, We'll be reading the second. So, where is that? Uh, share application window. And is that it? You see, uh, like, a, like a character in a ninja anime, you have to say the name of the command you're putting in the computer for it to work. You have to shout your attack out loud. Kyle! Exactly. <laughs> is it? Did it work? That is not the one. I, oh. have my, I have my own copy open in front of me, so I can start reading. Oh, where is it? Let me let me find what. Oh, crud! I have it here. I did. I thought I did. Why don't I start, and you can get the second half up in time for the as we move from the petty to the to the mediocre. You can have Mister. Uh... <laughs> uh, I don't know your last name. Ellender. No. Ellender. Mister Ellender can read the second half. May I start? Oh wait, I have. I here. I I have it. One moment. Uh. Uh, where is it? I ha there it is. That'll do. Okay. Is it? Uh, you is said it, now? it is, but I have my own copy open, so I don't need to see it. Okay. You said the world is going back to paganism. Oh, bright vision! I saw our dynasty in the bar of the house spill from their tumblers a libation to the Uranies, and leave us with Lord Russell wreathed in flowers, heralded with flutes leading white bulls to the Cathedral of the Solemn Muses to pay, where due, the glory of their latest theorem. Hestia's fire in every flat, rekindled, burned before the larder gods. Unmarried daughters with obedient hands tended it, and by the hearth the white-armed venerable mother Domum Sarabat Lanum Fasiabat. Duly, at the hour of sacrifice, their brothers came, silent, corrected, grave, before their elders. And on their downy cheeks easily the blush arose, it is the mark of freedmen's children, as they trooped, gleaming with oil, demurely home from palestra or the dance. Walk carefully, do not wake the envy of the happy gods, shun hubris. The middle road, the middle sort of men, are best. Idos surpasses gold, reverence for the aged is wholesome as a seasonable rain, and for a man to die defending the city in battle is a harmonious thing. Thus, with magistral hand, the Puritan Safrosune cooled and schooled and tempered our uneasy motions. Heathendom, come again, the circumspecion and the holy fears. Uh, you said it. Did you mean it? Oh, inordinate liar, stop. Or, did you mean another kind of heathenry? Think then, that under heaven roots little disk of earth, Fortified Midgard lies encircled by the ravening worm. Over its icy bastion spaces, giant and troll look in, ready to invade it. The wolf admittedly is bound, but the bond will break, the beast run free. The weary gods, scarred with old wounds, the one-eyed Odin, tear who lost a hand, will limp to their stations for the last defense. Make it your hope to be counted worthy on that day to stand beside them. The end of man is to partake of their defeat and die, 
his second, final death in good company. The stupid, strong, unteachable monsters are certain to be victorious at last. And every man of decent blood is on the losing side. Take as your model the tall women with yellow hair and plaits who walked back into burning houses to die with men. Or him who, as a death spear entered his vitals, made critical comments on its workmanship and aim. Are these the pagans you spoke of? Know your betters and crouch, dogs. You that have Vichy water in your veins and worship the event, your goddess history, whom your father is called the strumpet fortune. Okay. And that is the poem. A cliche came out of its cage. So, um, Mr. Wright, would you like to have the, uh, the first word on this one? Certainly. I would like to, in fact, borrow the first word on this one from uh, my fellow bad Catholic, Mark Barnes, the bad Catholic, who writes under the bad Catholic website as the bad Catholic. He says about this poem. <laughs> is he a bad Catholic, though? He is like all good Catholics, which is a good Catholic is a bad Catholic. We never quite, yeah, except for the saints, we've never quite uh, gotten up to our what we uh, what we've been told to do. <laughs> the good Lord has many has many servants who are not profitable to him. I'm afraid. In any case, Mark Barnes, brilliant brilliant writer, has this to say about this poem. I thought this this was an excellent epigram to start the discussion with. The pagans may have had false gods, but they had real men. The post Christian attempts to be God. And he loses man in the process. I noticed with delight the, uh, the structure of the poem, because there's two things the pagans had that the post-Christian does not have. One is the virtue of temperance, justice, moderation. And the other is the virtue of fortitude and courage. And the Norse were really, really down with courage, because they expected mm -hmm. to uh, fight and die. And not even the glory of victory was supposed to be their motive, because they were going to lose. Okay, you, you lose Ragnarok. Uh, but you got to be man enough to, to stand up with the gods. The beautiful gods are wounded in the wars against the, against the stupid, unteachable giants. Our modern post-Christians tend to, as far as I can tell, side with the giants. And as, for the, as for the world going back to paganism, I mean, the, the cleverness of the poem is, is right in the opening uh, title. The cliche, which we haven't, uh, we haven't heard that much these days, people used to complain that the world was going back to paganism because it was losing its Christian modesty and virtue and returning to the wildness the, um, the orgies, the dissolution of paganism. That's what the original phrase was meant to say. And of course, he's turning that phrase on its head by saying, you guys are actually, you, you, you wish we were going back to paganism because you moderns are actually worse than the so-called dissolute, you know, corrupt pagans of the days of old who didn't have the benefit of Christian morality. Well, of course, they did have the benefit of morality, the pagan morality, which is nobler than the morality of uh, selfishness and narcissism and nihilism. If I may, there's one or two references in the poem that, uh, that your, uh, your viewers might not be aware of that I'd like to explain, I, which I find particularly delightful. The Levis and the Lord Russell, who are supposed to be writhed in flowers and sacrificing a white bull to the muses in honor of the ancient theorem, that act of humility, sacrificing a bull to the, to the uh, gods, was uh, first done by Pythagoras in prayer, in praise, <laughs> for the Pythagorean theorem. Now, it's been a long time since anyone sacrificed a, a cow for a, for a ma mathematical theorem. <laughs> but what makes Levis and Russell, who are both, uh, uh, I don't mean to speak ill of the dead, both extraordinarily arrogant men, uh, so amusing to be seen wreathed in flowers and, uh, and uh, demurely and humbly offering thanks to the divine, the divine muses for their, uh, for their theories is, uh, Bertrand Russell was a famous atheist. Who, who put forward uh, arguments that are not as um, logical and coherent as maybe a mathematician should be, should be uh, familiar with. <laughs> and <laughs> Levis was a, uh, a fellow professor at uh, Lewis's school, and they were somewhat rivals. Uh, Levis did not have the talent that Lewis had at <laughs> making friends with people he argued with. He, he, uh, he uh, just assumed anyone who argued with him as a... Um, is an enemy. When F.R. Lewis was, announced that C.S. Lewis was dead to his uh, literature students at Cambridge, uh, the, uh, he said, uh, at least according to a man named uh, Keith Ma D. Keith Manor, who was then, then a student there, he said, they said in the Times that we will miss him. We will not. We will not. So there is the 
humility and the piety of your average run of the mill uh, between the wars or after the war uh, English atheist, uh, they they couldn't even stop themselves from spitting on graves. Okay, now come back. I'm afraid to press that. I, Go ahead. I was about to say I'm afraid they've gone downhill since then. Yeah, um, he he at least he at least had a uh, had a certain elegance for his insults to the dead. Uh, he Levis and Lewis had a sort of unbridgeable difference based on uh, they had very fundamental differences uh, about the uh, their theory of the of language, and it kind of I don't mean to, to bore your viewers. It kind of goes back to the difference between nominalism and realism. Lewis thought that when you say words, they mean real things, and Levis thought that words were arbitrary labels you attach to things. Uh, the the phrase in Latin about the the woman who is uh, who is uh, the the good wife. It goes. It, it goes from like the uh, like the uh, musical comedy uh, uh, song in uh, Fiddler on the Roof. It mentions the traditional behavior of the daughters, the sons, the mother, and the father. And he goes to the same. He goes to the same uh, list. Lewis does. Uh, and when he mentions the mother, he he has a phrase in Latin explaining what she's supposed to be doing in her home. That phrase I looked it up. It comes from a comes from a, a gravestone. It comes from a surviving. Uh, Inscription on a uh, on a burial uh, uh, stone, which reads this: "Friend was written here as brief. Stop and read it all. This is the unattractive tomb of an attractive woman. Her parents named her Claudia. She loved her own husband with her whole heart. She had two sons and leaves one of them on the earth, but placed the other one beneath it. Charming in conversation, proper in behavior. She safeguarded her house. She made wool. I've said it all. Go." The phrase being quoted there is, she safeguarded her house, she made wool. That's the role of a mother in pagan society. Now, if you want to picture the difference between that and what modern feminists think the role of women is, I don't think we can be sharper. <laughs> if, we were, if we were going back to paganism, we might have a lot more happy, uh, happy women uh, making happy homes. Well, the, one yeah. of the things that I've, I've heard uh, commented on is that the Industrial Revolution sort of, you know, really killed the woman's role in the economy because mm -hmm. it used to be that most textiles were produced in the home. Yeah. Uh, a lot of these small goods were handmade by women at home. You know, they would, you know, feed the children, clean the house, make stuff. And so they actually had a lot of economic power. But once we started, you know, factorializing, which is a mathematical term, but I'm going to use it improperly. <laughs> once we stuck everything in the factories, you know, and began mass, produ mass producing all these little knickknacks and tchotchkes that the women used to make and some, you know, economically extremely necessary thing, it really gutted the woman's role in the house and sort of gave, you know, provide some of the headwaters uh, for this whole, you know, flood of feminist goofiness that we've had to endure for the last hundred oh. years. To be fair, there was also a, a revolution in labor-saving appliances where the woman's work was suddenly much less burdensome than it had been. And you didn't need – back in the 30s, almost every middle-class house had a, had a woman who would come in to help cook and clean, would have a servant come in. And that was, that was all done away with, with washing machines and sewing machines and, you know, uh, uh, so on and so forth. Um, I'm, on, I'm on the line, Josh. Uh, the idos that suppresses gold, Hi, for those of you who don't speak ancient Greek, is, uh, is humility. And so compare the uh, the uh, the <laughs> they compare the postmoderns in all their humility and all their uh, unwillingness to uh, to express their opinions and all their desire not to push themselves forward or to or to sneer at other people or look down on other people. Compare that to what the ancients to what the pagans did. Okay, so uh, the saflasune is is a Greek word that means even mindedness. It's it's uh, temperance. So the the, the saflasune that's supposed to calm the minds is supposed to uh, stop the disordered motions of the passions and appetites in a young man's soul so as to make him fit for manhood. And we don't do that anymore. Instead, we try to make him not, sales not resistant. <laughs> we try to make him passionate so he will buy goods which are not manufactured in the household anymore. Uh, well, that actually, that, that actually reminds me, uh, I forget who uh, used this phrase, but um, it might be Jonathan Haidt um, H A I D T, um, who has has a book, um, The Righteous Mind, which I I highly recommend. Um, uh, yeah, that's hate. Okay, hi, hate. Anyway, but um, anyway, he has literally um, hate speech. 
<laughs> well, um, he, but anyway, um, he the righteous mind, very interesting book. But um, he, I think it was might have been him. He said he described um, today's uh, uh, system of like you know trigger warnings and safe spaces um, and all these things as a kind of um, malicious inverse psychotherapy. Uh, or because he says, um, like, if you look at how what therapists do, who are trying to help someone get over a um, help someone get over an a phobia, someone has an irrational fear of elevators, and what you do is, you know, first you show them a picture of an elevator, and you have them look at it for a minute and say, okay, you're all right. Think about that. You're all right. And then a couple days later you bring them physically in front of an elevator. They don't get in. They just watch it open and close a couple times. You're all right. And you do this, you know, gradually accustoming them to that which is troubling them. And they're, and they're able to learn their way around this. And then once they trust you, you shove them down the empty elevator shaft and collect the insurance <laughs> money. Is that? Exactly that's, modern that's people what, would do it. That's, that's, that's where I point. was going. <laughs> but, but, but did, I mention, like... did I mention I'm a bad Catholic? <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're but you're right. I see where you're going because we we the moderns uh, sensitize you to do the exact opposite. They take you to something you're not afraid of, a glass ceiling that you can't see, a microaggression that you can't sense, a dog a, a dog whistle that you can't hear, and they make you hear and see these invisible things. They and... make... Brutal young men who are, who are young enough and strong enough to go into war, to go into combat with a gun in their hand and say, hey, six-foot-tall guy, you are subject to tiny microaggressions. That guy, that guy caused you a tiny amount of infinitesimal pain if you misinterpret what he said. So you should now be upset. It's, it's a slave technique. They're trying to enslave people. I've got a people. whole lot of guys about 300 yards that way launching macroaggressions at me at a rate of five or 600 a minute. I ain't got time for your crap. <laughs> How did you even get here? <laughs> it ran. So, oh, and uh, so something I uh, I found very relevant. I was reading uh, this collection, a collection of J.K. Chesterton uh, essays, and I think regardless of the subject, you can all you can always find something J.K. Chesterton said that is relevant. Um, it may that take is quite a, a compliment. While. It, he he merits Chesterton merits the compliment. But uh, so this is from an essay on uh, about uh, the works of George Meredith, and he said, "Since Christianity broke the heart of the world and mended it, one cannot really be a pagan. One can only be an anti-Christian." Um, and that's kind of you know what C.S. Lewis. Well, not exactly the same. It relates to what C.S. Lewis said. It's related. Said. You can't, like... It's related because these, these virtues are also Christian virtues. Knights are supposed to act as brave as Vikings, and, and a Christian gentleman is supposed to be as moderate and as temperate and as pious as any pagan sacrificing to, the, to a, their false gods. Well, and that's why, um, you know, Christianity, uh, you know, took, uh, you know, not in, not in the Bible, but, like, I mean, in the rest of the tradition, Christianity took up the four, um, what do they call them? The four cardinal virtues. The four cardinal virtues, which the pagans recognize, which was right. temperance, prudence, justice, justice, and courage. Fortitude, right? Fortitude, right? And it took up the four, those four, and then you know Christianity added to them. They said there is more than this, which is right. the three are uh, faith, hope, faith sure. hope, and love. Right, right. And so, and yeah, the modern. See, the whole point of Lewis's poem here is this, this cliche is so false that if it ever broke free, if it ever came out of its cage, you would see that it would, it would shatter the modern conceit to nothing. Because even the pagans had those four virtues. The Christians have those virtues and more if they live up to them. But the pagans <laughs> don't even recommend living up to any virtue except for love of revolution, solidarity with fellow revolutionaries, and party loyalty. And complaining about things. And self-will. Lots There's of complaining. The line in the movie Gladiator that I always love where 
Commodus is the horrible emperor is saying to his father, Marcus Aurelius, the, uh, the father of Stoicism, I don't have virtues like those in your book, father. Things like temperance and courage. But I have other virtues like ambition. <laughs> Wasn't ambition something that was... Oh, wait, no. That was supposed to get you killed before they had yes. emperors. That was um, hubris. Right. And, right. Yeah. That was that was the reason Julius Caesar was assassinated, fairly or not. That right. was the charge against him. They tell you he was an ambitious man. Um, if exactly. it were so, it were a grievous fault, and grievously had Caesar answered it. Um, might have to do that speech someday. Um, but... <clears throat> that was a good one. Can I quote something else completely different from Chesterton that's right on this topic? It'll take me a moment or two if, if, you, if I can have the microphone. for Continue, a yeah, go. This is called the, strong, the Song of the Strange Ascetic. Asceticism is the, is the practice of undergoing probation for the sake of uh, religious discipline. G.K. Chesterton writes this. If I had been a heathen, I'd have praised the purple vine. My slaves should dig the vineyard, and I should drink the wine. But Higgins is a heathen. His slaves grow lean and gray, that he may drink some tepid milk exactly twice a day. If I had been a heathen, I would have crowned Nerea's curls and filled my life with love affairs, my house with dancing girls. But Higgins is a heathen, and to lecture rooms is forced, where his aunts, who are not married, demand to be divorced. If I had been a heathen, I'd have sent my armies forth and dragged behind my chariots the chieftains of the north. But Higgins is a heathen, and he drives the dreary quill to lend the poor that funny cash that makes them poorer still. If I had been a heathen, I'd have piled my pyre on high in a great red whirlwind gone roaring to the sky. But Higgins is a heathen, and a richer man than I, and they put him in an oven, just as if he were a pie. Now, who, now who <laughs> that runs to me, the riddle that I write, of why this poor old sinner should sin without delight? But I, I cannot read it, although I run and run, of them that do not have the faith, and will not have the fun. <laughs> <laughs> Do not know who Higgins is, but he apparently was in favor of cremation and the temperance movement and uh, fiat currency and other things good old-fashioned English Catholics like Chesterton were dead set against. Nerea, by the way, is the name of a famous courtesana, heterate of ancient, uh, ancient Athens. Oh, e even the horse I mean, get names. Hey, even, I mean, that, that brings us right back to our, uh, you know, our, our conversations on Byron, that if you're going to be a sinner, if you're going to go to hell, blow the doors off the place. No use. You, barely making it to heaven, some people see as a virtue, but barely make it to hell is just a damn shame. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you, aim for limbo. you aim for limbo and you strike hell by mistake. Poor old lady. <laughs> That's something I looked up. What was that? Was uh, well, that's in um, you know, C.S. Lewis actually. Uh, Screw tape proposes a toast. Yes. He talks about how um, how you know we have these we've we've you know I don't know if he quite used that term, but we've we've bred these people who are um, are barely worth damning. Yeah. Um, I believe was the phrase he used, and it's uh, because because they're so gray and tepid, they don't do vast impressive sins you know they're not they're not the doctor doom of sinning they're not the the, the darth vader they they're more like a a pencil pushing bureaucrat who sins in secret and it's you know it's something petty like cheating at cards not something grandiose like a murder suicide after a torrid love affair or something you know well and <laughs> and i think also from that he said that like you know it, 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 it's it's less it's less interesting for us the devils in that case um but it's safer because those great sinners have this habit of of occasionally, you know, breaking and turning into great saints, and that's <laughs> no good for us. And repenting uh, at the last minute. One of my this is kind of off topic, but one of my favorite saints is uh, Saint Cyril, who is the patron saint of magicians, because he was <laughs> a he was a magician. He was a magic user. What a horrible word for them! You can see I play too much D and D. Uh, he was a he was a magician back in the day before he converted. And so, if you ever want to get any of your uh, friends or relatives away from witchcraft, Saint Cyril is the guy who will uh, come to your aid if you pray. Well, what is uh? But uh, to, so, uh, in a phrase I say pretty often in these talks, to get back to the poem, um, 
<laughs> Do you want to know who the woman is? Walk back into the burning building that he refer- references. I looked that up also. I didn't know that was a specific woman, so go ahead. It is Signy, the only daughter of King Volsung of Hungerland and Claude the Giantess. That's who we're talking about. She and her true brother so, Sigmund were the oldest of the Volsung's 11 children. I won't bore you with the whole thing. Everyone else gets killed horribly by wolves. She arranges a incest on purpose to have a son on purpose to raise to avenge all her dead relatives and she marries and then kills her own husband and as he is in the house as he's in his fortress his long haul dying she is too proud to merely escape after having committed this horrible crime once her son finds out he's the son of incest so she turns and walks back into the the fire that she started so as to die big on top of a fire. I mean, Wagner did not invent Wagnerian endings to Norse epics, okay? He just put them to music. That's who it is. It's, it's Zygni, the, uh, the uh, sister of Sigmund. Yeah, and the, um, you know, and he's talking about the, uh, Norse the Norse. Hardcore, the Norse were so hardcore, that's what the poem is about. Can yeah, you imagine going, about, they're, yeah! they're burning, well, that spear is really but, well made, but you, you, but you launched it poorly. What your, what your back oh, come with. on, man. It didn't even hit my heart. I'm going to like, hop, I'm gonna drop along and suffocate from this. It's going to take 15 minutes. You suck. <laughs> and, and you I know, he... Dead spit roasted on the ground like a boar. But no, here I am dying and in Norse pain. Would, and, uh, and those Norse warlords would, if they were dying of some disease, they'd draw a sword and ask their men to fight them to the death so that they would actually die a battle death, not the straw <laughs> death. Because you don't get to Valhalla if you die the straw death. That, that, someone else gets it. <sighs> That's, uh, which is actually, um, for me, regrettably, you know, in my relatively low culture, for me, that references, um, the, uh, comic strip Order of the Stick. Nate, I think you're familiar with it. <laughs> um, I, I don't, Mr. Wright, have you heard of this? The Order Not of the Stick? I haven't heard of it, but I was really sad when Roy Greenhill did not break the stone that was given to him by the air elemental to save his life during a long plunge to his doom. Spoiler warning. Roy does not make it out alive. Though it's D&D, so they can get money together and resurrect him. It takes I, a while, though. Take, it Big does take thing. a while. He meets his mom in heaven. She makes the whole till death did we part thing. She's like, I ain't going back to your dad. Not only am I a fan of Order of the Stick, but I believe that the fifth edition of D&D put the flurbs, the flubs, the, the lawful good um, monsters that if you flip them over, they can't get back on their feet again, into the book again. They were from, I think... <laughs> One or two, because they appeared as a <laughs> in Order of the Stick. So whoever's writing Order of the Stick, I don't know who it is. Uh, I don't know the name of the uh, the artist. Oh, uh, has has shoot, influence I... even over. God, I haven't. Which... I haven't uh, said I haven't checked out Order of the Stick in like a year and a half. It's... I'm a whole big, the whole big, the whole big thing with Dark Durkon was like kind of you know. Right in the middle of it, and I was like, hmm, "This is going to be pretty good." And then life just took me one hundred percent away. You need to see how that resolves. You need to see how that resolves. It's pretty good. Great. Comic, it's great. It, it's it's it will show people that execution matters more than talent. Okay, <laughs> because he's drawing stick figures, and if he can tell a good story with stick figures, then you, whoever you are, you can tell a good story if you set your mind to it. Yeah. Anyway, so. but um, the 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 second <laughs> he tried like to I was get saying, back to the store and we got even further away. It happens, but anyway, the, the second the stick half... are pagans and they have pagan virtues. Roy Greenhill is there to avenge the death of his father, just like a uh, just like a Roman would. Mm-hmm. The, but the second half of the poem, he's talking about you know these um, the Norse mythology and like like. Short version of the story, everything's going to hell and there's nothing we can do about it. But yeah. you stand up anyway and you do what's right anyway. And like you you have to like you have to admire that in some fashion. Like, you know, and you know what he says, what is it? The and I, I kind of feel this way sometimes looking at what's going on in our world. Like, you know. The stupid, strong, unteachable monsters. Uh, are they now run our. They now run on our colleges, unfortunately. The stupid, strong, yes. unteachable monsters are certain to be victorious at, at last, and every man of decent blood is on the losing side. And it's like, and you look around and you're like, 
Yeah, pretty much. Like, it. it well, it's, and, and, and this, it's the Norse. It is, go ahead. Norse mythology strikes me as being like the unpolished, you know, sort of rough cut version of uh, like Tolkien sort of fantasy, which is like, you know, things built up this beauty and greatness, and then it is just degrading by degrees from there until the final darkness, right? And so, you know, with, you know, uh, so with Tolkien, you get like, you know, these, these beautiful creatures like the elves and all this, you know, these glorious last stands of men and whatever. Whereas with the Norse, it's just kind of, you know, one by one, we whittle them down. You know, Balder gets assassinated with a freaking mistletoe dart. <laughs> uh, you know, Odin tear his hand, by, no. tear his hand yeah, gets his hand bit off by, you know, by the wolf of destruction while he's trying to, you know, sort of... Well, that was, as, that as, was as, as a lie, as a falsehood, because Tyr swore up and down that they were going to unbind the wolf after they let him get bound up. Well, so but he, the gods but he did. did. But he did put his hand as collateral oh, on this. Sure, he, fulfill, he fulfilled that. So. Yes, but it's a but it's uh, but things are getting worse. Okay, well, the, the worm well, is going to win. The, the 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 serpent is going to eat Thor. It's, it's okay. He doesn't make it out alive. He doesn't get. He doesn't. One, get of, the cool, the... one of the cool things about it, though, is that almost pretty much uniquely among you know uh, pantheons is the fact that the Norse gods can be heroic like the greek gods can't be heroic you know they are like classically immortal they can't you know they're nigh and vulnerable like they can't really be destroyed in their in fact, essence when Ares is wounded by diomedes in the battle before troy he goes whining back to his father who calls him a dog because <laughs> he's invulnerable but the, but the norse gods are the wounded gods the norse gods are the gods who suffer for the sake of mankind and they can like I said, and they can categorically be killed because that's the whole thing is that you know that's what they're going to do in the end is all die and you know so they you know they go on these adventures and they actually have heroic adventures as gods and that's really interesting and it, well, you know, and it seems like it, it allows the you know the people rather than holding them up as like the platonic ideal of the thing it's like no they have to you know they're just very very powerful men almost you know they can do these amazing things but we can stand, you know, it gives you the ability to stand beside them because the spear that kills you kills him too. Yeah. Well, and that's the, um, that's also, uh, you know, it reminds me of what uh, G.K. Chesterton said at another point, and I don't, I believe it's in orthodoxy, but I don't have it handy. But he said, like, you know, in Christianity alone, like, God can actually, like, God can actually, you know, God can actually meet us. God can actually, you know, feel pain. God can and did lose in, at, you know, in that moment. And like, you know, and if you know a, a revolutionary movement, you know, that wants to, you know, set out against insurmountable odds, well, Christianity is the only religion for you because Christianity is the only one where God was a rebel. Um, and it's you know a little bit of the a. a little bit of the same thing you know you were saying about the Norse gods where you know they have you know they have courage and they and you know they have it's lost desperate courage it's hopeless courage it's not courage with any hope of gain it's it's all it's supernatural courage because if you're if you're only courageous for some reward that's going to come to you in this world they don't hope for any reward in this world or the next because they're just gonna all die Okay, that's stoicism at its ultimate. And you're right about Tolkien. Both he and C.S. Lewis were big fans of the Northern mythology. And there's an element of melancholy that floats through the Lord of the Rings. It's very clear. All the beautiful, fine, old things are passing away. And that the, the, the world, get, world is, is descending into, uh, to put it in Christian terms, the world is, is, is approaching the time of the Antichrist, the time of, of Armageddon. The only difference is that we... Armageddon is on our side, and we win, and all the pagan Norse gods who are serving the devils like Odin and stuff, they lose and go to hell. So, I mean, I still admire them for their bravery. <laughs> I'm not saying They're it's the same good. combat. I'm not saying it's the exact same battle, but I'm saying it's the same battle. And, the difference and, is, and, but, but that they, melancholy, they, they, Christian, yeah. that melancholy, there's a line of that that runs through Christianity that you're not going to find in, like, uh, 
the prosperity gospel, wherever where, where the version of Christ that that sometimes people say a false Christ, where he says he's all just love and flowers, he's all just you know uh, happiness and and uh, peaches. Soap. No, soft it, soap Christ. it's the soft soap Christ is not the Christ. There's a Norse uh, sternness to the Christian story about death mm-hmm. and sacrifice and. Odin hung himself on a tree with a spear, and Christ got hung on a tree as well. I mean, there's, there's well, obvious and... parallels there, and the only difference is that our our God gets up again, our God comes back. You know? Yeah. No, what I was well, and the was, other uh, what I was saying with the soft soap Christ and the whole prosperity gospel, you know, love, 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 peace, 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 money, heaven. Yeah. Like, there's a lot more to it. Well, and the <laughs> and other they, thing with the North North thing, but there's a very, North, very, but there's a very deep bit of North starch in their in their shorts too, and uh, for that for that kind of thing. But but to bring it back to the poem, if I may, the, the cliche that comes out of its cage, the myth, the Norse myth and the Greek myths are simply more dignified and more realistic, even if they're more melancholy than this modern myth of endless evolution where things just get better and better. We are always better than our fathers who are always stupid and we don't have to listen to them. There's nothing in the past we have to preserve. You know, the future is going to be uh, men like gods, kind of the H.G. Wells view of the future, where science will soon solve every problem and will conquer all of nature and produce utopia. Okay. Which I'm sorry. is, That's what which is why not utopia is not coming. Not which is why we're anymore. erasing history. Because, you know, they're all stupid, uh, they're all, you know, racist, blah, 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 and so we're going to erase history, you don't need to know about any of that, you don't need to know where you came from, you don't need to, you know, know who your fathers were. There's no golden chain of obligation leading from your ancestors to your descendants, because all you have to worry about is number one. You do have to well, and about the environment for your children, but that's about it. You don't really have to pass anything along because they're going to be superhuman. They're going to be well, beyond. They're going to be living in this socialist utopia where the law of cause and effect and the law of supply and demand are just going to be obviated. Just going to go away. Okay. Well, and, and the and other thing we're and they think we're the mystics. Yeah. Okay. Whatever. And, and the other <laughs> thing that goes along with that, if you if you abolish the idea that you should honor those who came before you and especially like you know literally your literally your ancestors that you should honor you know your honor your father and mother and honor you know those who came before you and and know your history and love your people if you abolish that you also abolish the idea that your children are going to should should owe any of that to you and that might and and i mean and if you take that away if you take away the idea that children should respect their parents should love you know their parents more than a random stranger um yep that probably has something to do with you know the you know decline among people who hold this philosophy of having children because why, do you why think, would you why do you think levis spoke so casually ill of the dead if you don't believe in the golden chain if you don't believe that the past and the future are part of the now then you don't care about the dead the poet, we don't know his name, who wrote Beowulf, was a Christian. There are scholars who disagree, but I disagree with them. But he never depicted the pagans in that story as being dishonorable or, or uh, vile. He mentions them doing some devil worship at a time, and he, he ascribes it to their desperation. But otherwise, he speaks about them uh, with great dignity. And the classical culture in the Mediterranean, the Roman culture did the same thing. Dante puts Roman and pagan references throughout his poem, okay? Weaves them throughout. The, the, idea, that, the idea that we should uh, turn on our ancestors because they were less developed in revelation than we are is not a Christian idea. Uh, the, the, the Europeans are the only people who go to other cultures and like try to figure out what the, uh, what the hieroglyphs of Egypt say. The Romans never did that. The, the hieroglyphs of Egypt were a living language at the time when the Romans conquered them, at the time of Mark Anthony. As far as we know, no one, no scholar ever went there to find out what it was. They weren't, they weren't concerned with all humanity because, to them, not all men were brothers. To the Christian, all men are brothers. We uh, even object when people blow up uh, giant statues of, uh, of Buddha. We, we are offended by that. And that's, that's not our God. Hey, but, don't cut but, down those idols. Those are culturally like, important. Having their work be destroyed wantonly. See? Now, so the moderns here that Lewis is talking about, 
if you, you would be lucky if you became a pagan and you had even half of their virtue. Uh, you know, you had mm-hmm. their temper because people just tend to forget what the real pagans are really like. You got to you got to read the old books, and you're not going to read the old books if you think that you're the Superman. That's going. That's you know, you think you're. If you believe in evolution, you have no reason to look at the past. I, excuse me, I don't mean evolution. I don't mean Darwinian evolution, which is a biological theory. I mean this Hegelian the modern social. Marxist. Yeah, the, so- the social uh, evolution. Right, and one of the best guys who argues against this social idea of evolution of all things is a socialist himself. My my uh, the, the the first member of my guild, H.G. Wells, because his Morlocks are post humans, but they're not better than humans. His Eloi are the next step of evolution. They're perfectly suited for their environment as food animals <laughs> with no backbone <laughs> and no manhood among them who can't defend themselves. OK, so so don't talk to me. If you're going to talk about evolution, at least read Wells and you'll find out humanity well, may not be the direction you want it to go. Well, that's the thing. I made a uh, I made the observation to a professor of mine when I was uh, in college. It's probably the only good counter lick I got against uh, you know the indoctrination. But uh, it was you know talking about yeah you know, evolution makes things more perfect for all. I'm like what, yeah, sir? He's like yeah. I'm like it doesn't really make it more perfect. It just makes it different. You know, it's just change. And C.S. Lewis expounds on this a bit more in his uh, talk about yeah. social evolution. And he's talking about, you know, people who think that evolution is just progress forward don't understand evolution. For every one, you know, every one advantageous mutation, you know, every advantageous change, there are 10, 20, 100 disadvantageous ones that don't succeed. And so just because, you know, we can see where the, you know, the advantages have been gained, don't think that changing something is automatically going to make it better. And better by what standard? If there's no law exactly. but human law, if, if you're if you're an atheist, then there's no law higher than human law. There's no moral code higher than what human what humans devise or invent for themselves. And so, if there's no standard aside from what we invent, then if we invent rather than discover the standard, then we can change the standard. We can rewrite the any constitution we write. We can't rewrite the Pythagorean theorem because we didn't write that. We discovered that. You see the difference? What I'm saying. Uh-huh. So so anyone who thinks that evolution is aiming at something. Well, if you, you either believe that or you believe – if you believe evolution is aiming at something, you have to believe that history is a goddess. I, I think she's a strumpet myself, just like Lewis does. But uh, uh, <laughs> you have to think – if you're a Marxist, you have to think that history is alive and is an intelligent being and has deliberately designed history to move toward the socialist utopia of your dreams. And then it will come down from heaven adorned like a bride uh, on, the, on the world's last day. Because I mean, let's be serious. Marxism is just another her- heresy of Christianity. There's no reason. To, there's no reason in the Marxist worldview to be concerned for the poor. If there's no God, then why why be concerned for the poor? The pagans weren't all that concerned, you know. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The 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 modern modernism is just a, a, a take it takes one part of Christianity and blows it up out of proportion and misses the heart of it, and therefore misses most of the virtue. And they don't even retain the good old strong virtues of the pagans, the, the temperance and the modesty of the Greeks, or the warrior spirit of the Norse. What they have instead the is thing. a kind these... of a selfishness. They, they have instead kind of the last men of Hegel, kind of a soft, selfish uh, narcissism that leads nowhere. If you believe history is a goddess, then why not worship her with a cow? like you're supposed to, and sacrifice pigeons and so on. If you think she's blind, then what makes you think she's going to lead anywhere? If it's a blind process, it's not leading to utopia. It could lead to it could lead to the Morlocks and the Eloi just as well, just as easily. Well, the blind process leads to the heat death of the universe. I mean, we all know where the, you know, where random entropy is going to go. It's yeah. going to go where everything is so averaged out, there's nothing. Right, right. Right. It's going to take everything and spread it so evenly. That's the only part of the modern anymore. myth I think is. That's the only part of the modern myth I actually think is dignified. Those who actually acknowledge that we are all going to die and turn into dust, and even our monuments will be forgotten, uh, at least have a kind of Norse gloom to them because they know everything is futile and everything they're doing is meaningless. You know, and then they can go whore around and end up dying in a whorehouse like a, or a madhouse like Nietzsche, who also came to that same conclusion. You know, so I'm yeah. not a big admirer of Nietzsche. I am not a big admirer of our, our current age because Nietzsche is the most famous philosopher 
of the past that is that is still being taught in schools. Even though he never wrote a single syllogism in any of his written works. <laughs> What's that? Let's see. I'm trying to think of... Because uh, Mr. Wright is about to have to leave us. I was trying to think if there was anything uh, quick. Um, but no, the homework movies tell me that Mr. Wright never leaves us. He always comes and rescues us from our middle-class drudgery. No, no, that was my wife I'm rescuing from middle-class drudgery. you got to find a woman of your own. And if you're, if well, you're, did. She brought if the you're kids home early. You be, be if you're a Christian man, you better be chivalrous about it and uh, realize <laughs> strong is here to serve the weak and the, uh, you know, and be very well, nightly. I'll tell you what I'm going to well, do. I'll tell you what and I'm he's gonna also do. never going to give go us and up and off. he's never going to let us down. He's never going <laughs> to no, run around. Mr. Astley. No, see, I'm going to pull a sobbing women. I'm just going to find myself, you know, a, you know, a, a comely looking lass and drag her away from her family off in the wilderness and then I'll convert later. I recommend oh, wait, uh, watch the movie Seven Brothers Crap. for Seven Brothers, which has a oh, song about the seven women, mm-hmm. and you can and you can re- recite that as you're stuffing the young lady into a bag or whatever, you know. <laughs> I've seen that movie. Now, pretty weird. I just want to tell the NSA or anyone else who's listening that I am not actually advocating an abduction or a forced marriage. You know, I, I, I actually pay off the father beforehand so his seven brothers don't come and kill you, because otherwise she's gonna arrange for your murder, and then walk into the fire. Because <laughs> maybe she doesn't convert with you. <laughs> it just leads to a whole lot of problems. It, it does. It does. You think you can gather to... your donkeys and goats and go make a good trade. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. Make a good trade. Do you or know... Alligators, if you're, or if you're before somewhere came... from alligators and catfish. Back when I was an atheist, uh, there were so many false things I thought about Christianity. Is there any re- religion, any culture, uh, aside from the Christian one, where the woman has to consent to be the bride i don't believe in buddhism they require the woman to say yes or in confucianism or anything else and is there anyone else who says one woman no concubines no divorce christ said no divorce king henry the eighth disagreed with him and i think king henry i mean no no offense to my to my protestant brethren but uh, i would tend to trust christ over henry you know i yeah i I have to say i'm not trying to be judgmental you're damned i'm not trying to be judgmental I am, but I'm not trying to be. You can you can make you can make an argument for for Protestantism in general, but it's really difficult to make an to make a serious argument for the Church of England if you know the history. I'm sorry, <laughs> he wanted a divorce. I don't believe the like, English have ever taken religion uh, seriously. Uh, the only ones who have are Lewis and Tolkien and uh, and uh, Chesterton, and maybe a few uh, saints, maybe Joseph of Arimathea, who buried the Holy Grail. That's the one I like about being a Christian is I can now I can now believe in all this sort of fairy tale stuff that's actually real. Whereas if I'm a if, when I was an atheist, the only fairy tale I believed in was infinite evolution to ever ever achieving goodness, ever greater. And that's what like I said. You're following the Lewisian path on that one because that's what he was talking about. Is like you know of all these things, you know, that one's still attract you know is still an attractive idea to him. He says he just keeps it where the same place he keeps his you know his Homer and his uh, Odin and visits it very. He visits it often, but as a, as a fable. On my bookshelf, I have a trilogy called The Golden Age, written by me, myself, and I, which is exactly the utopian libertarian idea of ever-increasing capitalist uh, futures leading to transhumanism, leading to infinite uh, growth. But I was an honest enough atheist to be a pagan, by which I said... Uh, She's getting snacks. <laughs> my You're, my wife would my wife would do me physical her off. harm. <laughs> my wife would do me physical harm if I uh, unannounced dropped her into one of these. Um, she is she is retreating toward the firearm, so she might still. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what was wait? Oh, well, I'm, say that uh, I'm sorry, I, own, I interrupted you. In my own book. I'm pagan enough to say the the, the princi- at the end of that book the. The superhumans have to deal with the fact that they're all going to die, because entropy wins in the end, no matter how high your technology is. So. Well, and I, I was also going to say, in recommendation of Mr. Wright's uh, Golden Age trilogy, um, I've read a, f- I, I've read a fair bit of science fiction. I've read several um, science fiction authors who try to do um, like post, you know, post-human or transhuman societies. And um, his is the first 
that I've seen that has characters that are both like recognizably, you know, developed or evolved or whatever past us, and also still recognizably you know, human and you care about them and you want to know what they do and who wins and who loses. Um, I've seen uh, several authors who who write that so those kind of things, and none of the characters are human in an emotional sense. Thank you for the compliment. I uh, had never heard the phrase humanism. Uh, excuse me, I'd heard humanism, transhumanism before I wrote that book, and I found it to my surprise there was a whole community of people daydreaming about overcoming human limitations by means of technology. Uh, something that I had made up as a make believe. And sort of like a science fiction writer who invented the idea of overpopulation for a science fiction book, and there's people who really believe in it, or who believe in UFOs, <laughs> who think we're being visited by flying saucers. Well, I'm the guy who makes this garbage up, and it's, it's mythology, okay? I'm trying to make a comment about the human condition. Uh, you know, not a, not, a, not a deep comment, just blah, 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 but a comment nonetheless, because it's art, okay? <laughs> art, darn you. So, uh, these guys were... Very interesting to talk to, and I'm glad they liked my book, but they, at least some of them, not going to say all of them, thought that we could overcome entropy. We could just wish it away. Which is fun. Those are the bad guys in my book. <laughs> the, guy, the guys who don't face reality. The, the only, back when I was an atheist, I was pagan enough to say, truth is true, and if you don't face reality, that is sin. That's, I didn't have a word for it then. I didn't call it sin because I wasn't Christian. But I knew that that... There's a fundamental dishonesty to modern thinking that I rejected. And C.S. Lewis was a kindred spirit of mine, even though I was not of his religion, even back in the day. Because the pagan... Look at Socrates. Socrates is willing to die for the truth. Okay? Uh -huh. he's, he's, he's a, we can use the word martyr, if we want, without, without doing violence to the term. Are the modern yeah. people, are any of them that level of... Uh, are any of them as dignified, as moral, as upright as Socrates? He fought in combat. I mean, he was a warrior. He was he was kick ass, you know. Well, and the uh, and he was unhappily married, and his wife made fun of him. So that proves he was just more like. <laughs> by all means, by all means, get married. If you find a good wife, you will be happy. If you get a bad wife, <laughs> you will become a philosopher. Um... <laughs> I found I found a good wife and a good editor at the same time. So I I got I was doubly lucky. But, oh, um, nice. What was uh, that, nice. that actually? That actually reminds me. Um, <laughs> I have another uh, C.S. Lewis poem that I'm planning on posting um, this coming Monday, uh, which is in praise of solid people. From it's and it's from a collection of his poems written when he was um, an atheist, I believe. Um, and it's kind of funny because if you hear like. If you if you read this poem without any context, you would n certainly not identify it with the atheists of today. <laughs> um, because and like I, I look at this, I'm like, well, if he was an atheist, then it's clear he was go not going to stay one. Because, like, there's just it's just these he basic knew these basic he hardworking decent people. It's all about. How good it is that they are there, and in a sense, how he envies them, even even though, like he he says, in, like intellectually, you know, they are not intellectually they're not my kind of people, and they don't work at my at the they don't think about the kind of things I think about. But it's all about his respect for them, and yeah. you like the atheists today. There is a. And like a long the way core from of clingers. Is, well, Lewis, and, yeah, the core. Yes, Lewis is. I mean, uh, G.K. Chesterton's the same way. He has great respect for the common man, for the working man, for the illiterate man, for the peasant, and the uh, the modern the modern uh, god haters, the modern antichrists, have nothing but contempt for the peasant. They have nothing but contempt for the working man, even though they say they're on his side. You know, they they have nothing but contempt for children oh. or virgins. They yeah. don't use the word virgin anymore at all. They have nothing but contempt for mothers and motherhood. They don't like mothers or virgins, so they don't like Mary most of all because she's a twofer. You know. <laughs> nice. What I will say to you is, is, they claim to be on your side, but the guy who shoots you in the back had to be on your side too. 
That's one reason why they're so exasperating. It's because they're all quizlings. They're traitors. They get people to trust them and say, we're going to show you the way forward to utopia. We're going to show you the intellectual heights of truth. You're going to shuck, shuck off the shackles of, of uh, Christian superstition and enter into an enlightened scientific world. And you go, yes, what a brilliant thing. What's in your scientific world? Well, if you have an XX chromosome, you're not necessarily a woman. Wait, is that that what your science is telling you? Wait, yes. Hang on. It's science. Like, wait, put that put that down in dumb layman's terms. Wait, you mean if you if you have you know the blocks and tackle, you can be a woman, but if you have the oven for the buns, you can be a man. Well, once A Hold is on not a, a, once you get rid of the principle of self-identification, the principle of non-contradiction, it's really hard to claim to be pro-science when you <laughs> don't even have the basic building blocks of how to do epistemology or, or science yeah. or w when you're afraid of the sun monster, when you're lighting fires in Australia and saying, oh, that's caused by global cooling or global warming. I forget what it is this decade. It changes every 10 years. Uh, excuse me. I'm old enough to remember in the 70s when the next ice age was being touted by the same people who are touting the next the, that the world will end in fire. Okay. Oh, interestingly. Um glacier uh glacier national park i had to take down some signs uh where it said these glaciers will all be gone by 2020 i think they should offer they refunds yeah, to everyone who came the... because they wanted to see them before they were gone yeah, i think they I, I should guess, sacrifice I guess they haven't changed the name to just national park so i'm guessing the glaciers are still there or who knew you see you can you can mock the pagans if you like but the pagans at least respected their ancestors and they knew that two men such as men are now could not pick up a stone that hector can pick up easily with one hand because men of old were great men okay our founding fathers here in america were great men they were freaking geniuses they gave us a lot the saints and the fathers of the church and the people who died to spread the word of love great men we can we do not see their like these days c.s lewis and uh, and uh, professor tolkien and gk jesterton great men you know uh, I, I would hate to live... And when I was an atheist, I wasn't that kind of atheist. Because they, they're actually religious. <laughs> I was a real atheist who actually didn't believe in the supernatural. They think everything is controlled by symbols, controlled by signs, controlled by magic. They think if you change the word man to woman, you can change a man to woman. They think if you, if you, if you call something evil by a good name, that it becomes good. Or if you call something... Uh, they think they can abolish cause and effect and, and uh, supply and demand just by fiat. They're, they're witch doctors. Yeah. I was not a witch doctor. I might have been a you know a filthy atheist, but I wasn't. I wasn't one of the. I wasn't that filthy. So I would have been honored to be a pagan back in the day because I read the Stoics. I read Marcus Aurelius. I read Epictetus. I read Socrates. I mean, those guys were hardcore. Those guys were virtuous. I would, and uh, you know, I I threw out a book recommendation earlier, and you know, this is on a you know, slightly different line. I would also recommend you know the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. Man. Um, un until Gutenberg goes full SJW, you can get it from Gutenberg.org, um, and it, you know for free, and it's relatively short, and it's definitely worth working your way through. I would also um, recommend the Enchiridion of Epictetus, who is a who is a, a, a Stoic, and he was a slave. So the Stoics included both an emperor and a slave. So you got all ranks of society, both the great and the mediocre and the petty were all involved. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to find a way to append this title to to us. <laughs> well, <sighs> the, the, the Chinese emperors were kind enough to wait until after they were dead before they got a title attached to their names. But we moderns are more uh, more evol evolutionarily advanced than they are, so we can just do it while we're still alive. So. Any, I, I think it's, it I think it's time for me to uh, turn into a pumpkin, gentlemen. Okay, right. thank you for joining us, um, and uh, we will ho hopefully we'll uh, talk to you again before too long. I have one more Solomon Kane poem uh, <laughs> in the file, so yep. we'll now we'll I, as a Catholic, out. regard the Puritans as being noble pagans. So you know, I really admire them, but I, you know, they, they, don't, they don't have the fullness of the truth. They have most of the truth, but not all the truth. The moderns, the postmoderns, they have anti-truth. They're, they're, I mean. They're the enemy. Uh, I wish they were defined by something else, some other principle, except for whatever Christ is for, they're against. 
You know, because mm-hmm. in the old days they used to be in favor of things like science and and social progress, and now they're not. They don't even have that. They got rid of that too. Well, so noted, noted uh, alcoholic, you know, noted alcoholic uh, Steve Green made the observation: if you put social in front of something, you basically invert the meaning of the second word. Yeah, it's like the Greek uh, the Greek word anti. Yeah. So I said, in any case, <laughs> it's modern you anti. Got, gentlemen, and your household. Thank you, Good night. Have you told your wife about their plan to go kidnapping Sabine women yet? That was his. That was I his know, plan. I'm pointing at him. Oh, okay. Oh, well, I mean, you know, there's a lot of laundry to do. <laughs> <laughs> just as long as just as long as the first wife gets to be first wife, I'm sure she'll be okay with that. Yeah, no, all the property still goes to her. The second wife is going to just have to have strong sons to support her after I die. No, that's not even the way the Muslims do it. The, according to the Muslims, God. you have to have Oh, I'm, just, I'm, trying, I'm starting my own house thing. Per woman. You have to have enough money. Only only the rich guys really get to have this polygamy thing going for them. Because well, you have to yeah, have more, I, mean, I, really I really hope y'all heard the what I'm whistling in female, after my last yes. comment. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear it because I, I talked. My mistake. I, I said it's I really roughly 50% male. And... Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, no. I'm I'm just... 50... Ah! Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. It's roughly, 50, it's roughly 50% male and female. That's how it has to be. Anywhere there's polygamy. Yeah, which means you get a lot of young men to go out and fight wars. So, yeah. Okay. Good what night. was your last comment? What was your last comment? Oh, the name? oh I was just hoping y'all heard the what come flying in after I made my comment. Because mom was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's, a, it's an exercise in Christian humility to go apologize to your wife. <laughs> Which is something Achilles, I'm sure Achilles never did that. Or Agamemnon, excuse me, I shouldn't say Achilles, I, he wasn't married. Agamemnon never did that. He, nah. he ended up getting axed to death in the bathtub. So, But he didn't whine and complain about it, because so, he was a pagan. Anyway, adios. May God have a good night. That, uh, have a good night. Okay. Um, well, uh, I think we... I don't know if we covered the poem terribly well, but we had a good talk. Was there yeah. any final, were there any final thoughts you wanted to um, throw in before we close off for the evening? Uh, just a quick plug for my channel. Uh, it's just me, my name, Nate Ellender. You can find me on the YouTubes, uh, or the MeTubes in that case. But uh, upcoming essay I'm going to be recording soon called Hydroponic Philosophies. Touches on some of the same stuff that, you know, uh, this whole idea of cutting yourself off from the root of the past um, and removing history from your, you know, from your theories and how it weakens them. Okay. And I will, um, I will once again put a link uh, to your channel in the show description. And uh, with that said, uh, good evening and thank you for joining me. And I hope we'll catch you again soon. Hmm? I can't do this.